Hello, podcast listeners. Welcome to another episode of Podcast with Gautam and Jin. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope everyone's summer is going well. My name is Jin Thansti, and with me is my co-host, Gautam Sivaj. And today, we're super excited to have Michael Haydock with us. Michael is an IBM fellow in the IBM consulting business, specializing in numerical optimization and machine learning. Michael, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Gautam. Thanks for having me here. You're welcome. Now, Michael, given your current position, what's your perspective on how machine learning can be leveraged for production and forecasting? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, I, I've been working in this uh, particular area for probably about eight years. Okay, P uh, prediction uh, much longer, okay, but using uh, specifically machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques. Um, all started with a client that had a need. Um, the need kind of lended itself to um, this uh, area of technology, let's say. And um, I, I think it's incredibly um, proficient at being able to make predictions, okay? And so I, I try to predict all different kinds of time series. In fact, I keep about 85 different data sets, okay, that I use as um, experimental data sets whenever, whenever I um, am auditioning a new uh, machine learning strategy or, or an algorithm or just kind of a switch to it or something, right? And um, it, it's, it's incredibly proficient at picking up patterns. And so I think the reason for that is, is that there's a lot of nonlinear techniques um, uh, embedded in machine learning. So the activators in a machine learning environment, okay, which are kind of the, the ways that uh, it triggers uh, different uh, behaviors, let's say, within the algorithm, um, those activators are all nonlinear, okay? And so this is just a better curve fitter. So it, it kind of senses, um, you know, what's been done in the past, okay? And I use some techniques that are called um, long short-term memory, LSTM, okay, in the in the business. And this long short-term memory, it, it has a long-term memory. It remembers the patterns over time. And then it has a very short-term memory. So it goes back into um, small patterns and looks for these really interesting uh, areas of, let's say, a projection uh, to do forecasts with. Now, I've been mostly using um, this as a predictor of uh, time series analysis. So all my uh, research has been in the in the time series uh, area, but I could also say uh, event series. So we've done things with human behavior as an example, which has nothing to do with, let's say, the, the actual numerical values in a time series. And a time series might be something like the unemployment rate or something where, you know, every month it's, there's a cadence. Okay, you know what I mean? And I get a value, uh, you know, every month. Um, an event series would be something that is um, uh, not necessarily graded in, discrete time periods, okay? It happens when it happens. When you go shopping on Amazon, you know, you don't you do not do it at a regular interval every month. You do it when you need something, okay? So I'll just call that an event series. So um, uh, irrespective of it, uh, there's a timestamp on it, okay? And so I have some uh, discrete uh, time period where something happens uh, and the machine learning can come in, uh, pick up that time period, and um, make a quite an accurate forecast. One, one of the things that I do on a daily basis is I work with volatility indexes and I do this uh, forecast seven days a week. And uh, just by the, uh, the, the name of the, uh, the time series, volatility, okay, you'd think that this thing would be all over the place and that the error rates are incredibly low. So I'm, I'm able to hit, um, you know, within a couple of percentage points, uh, typically uh, over the long term. Uh, these values of these highly volatile uh, data sets. So I think machine learning is really built for forecasting and prediction. Excellent. Now, Michael, you mentioned, um, you know, your analysis having low error rates. Um, can you give us an example of the impact your analysis had for a client or a situation? Yeah, um, that, that's a really good question. The, uh, recently, okay, um, in fact, I just kind of stopped the time series um, uh, forecasting on a daily basis of um, COVID. Okay, so I was producing a what I call the COVID index for each county in the United States. So there's about you know 3,400 counties, right? 
And uh, this was on a daily basis. And the idea was to be able to take the medical data that was out there. Okay, so for instance, John Hopkins data, There's there was a bunch of data on uh, COVID cases and various circumstances around COVID. And I, I married it with the volatility index. Okay, and my question wasn't um, what what are the COVID cases going to be in that particular county. I did that as a forecast, but there's all there's also medical forecasts that get produced uh, that actually produce that number that might be more reliable. My my inquiry was around risk. What's the risk in a county? So is a county going to shut down or the business is going to shut down? Um, okay, so I started this in uh, March of 2020, which if you remember, that was probably the first month that you know COVID sort of. You know, took a, a huge spike and shut down the country, shut down the world, uh, pretty much, right? And um, you know, the inquiry was, um, should I go shopping? Should I keep my store open? Can I get supplies? Okay, from you know, or uh, for instance, I did a um, a study for a, a food uh, retailer. Okay, that um, could could they get uh, pork? Could they get chicken? Could they get beef? Right? Um, or were those farms going to be shut down? You know, the employees had COVID and so forth. And so we were able to help them with their protein strategy on what they should be selling at their store based on what they could actually get, okay? And so uh, the the accuracy of these, of these forecasts were just absolutely uh, critical. Plus it was, it was the only forecast of its kind that was out there. So this forecast got used a lot and it helped people understand what was gonna sell and what wasn't gonna sell. So, for instance, um, uh, I live in Minnesota where there's, you know, an abundance of uh, mosquitoes. Okay, and so, you know, where are we going to sell mosquito repellent during that spring and summer season of 2020? Well, normally mosquito repellent would fly off the shelf, but everybody's indoors now. Okay, and so, you know, it wasn't going to sell, right? So that's, you know, examples of those kinds of things where we could tell our retail partners, you know, this is what to expect. Okay, so don't overstock that particular item. And there's a cost for overstocking. So um, uh, we use that on pretty much all products. We did maybe about four or five different grocers, as an example, um, where we use machine learning and this external data set that uh, we created. Um, and, and we did this seven days a week. So, uh, and, it, and I think it really helped a lot of companies, um, you know, get through COVID, get through it wisely. That's excellent. So, um, Gautam, I'll turn it over to you for your questions. Thank you. So, embedding real-time scenarios uh, and blending it with the integration of uh, uh, data science projects is a great idea. And uh, from here, my question is, uh, uh, with the advancement in prediction and forecasting, will artificial intelligence be sentient in, say, next five years? Wow, that's that's a really uh, that's a tough question. Okay, that, but a good question. I, I mean, super fair question, right? So, so if you look at it, um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, picks up the facts uh, very well. Okay, so we want to make sure that we have, um, let's say, databases and access to the facts. The other thing that artificial intelligence can pick up is um, not just, let's say, from uh, numerical data that's stored in a database that we're you know, kind of used to numbers, you know, things you'd put in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet. But, it, but it's also good at things like um, other senses. It, it can uh, sense uh, a, a hearing. So it can interpret something it hears. It can interpret something it sees. So I can depixelate a picture, okay? So if for some reason, um, you know, I was uh, disappointed about something, okay? It might be able to pick up a facial expression and it might be able to say, oh, whatever it is I'm doing, I have to stop that because of this facial expression. And the thing that I think that uh, we need to inject into the artificial intelligence environment is um, our wisdom. Okay, so it's not going to pick up wisdom you know, by itself. Wisdom is something that we're going to have to share um, and we're going to have to store that wisdom. So it's the wisdom of expertise, okay, of a person with a particular kind of skill um, how do we go about cataloging that skill? Well, there's been a lot of efforts over the years on uh, knowledge databases, okay? And so to me, those, those things are probably gonna come back because what we're trying to do is we're trying to mimic 
okay, uh, with through artificial intelligence, our best experts, right? So, um, for as an example, um, uh, not not using a, a sentient, uh, let's say, uh, or or the wisdom in it, but um, we've created a. Uh, I created an application for a grocery store, okay, that was replenishing a shelf, right? So, how much should I order? All right, and either side of making that ordering decision, if it's not perfect, there's a penalty for it. Okay, so the system, I, I was using reinforcement learning techniques and the system could pick up these particular kinds of uh, penalties, right? Where I was over, I ordered too much stuff or I was under, I, I didn't have enough on the shelf so I missed a sale, okay? And that to be is fact, right? So it could pick up those facts and what I was trying to create was a digital twin of a super smart replenishment manager that would look at a forecast of demand. And then that's how they probably triggered ordering their inventory. And that uh, super smart uh, digital twin, okay, would kind of look at the forecast and say, you know, you're always a little bit high. I'm gonna tamp this thing down a little bit, okay? So it's using its wisdom and its experience to be able to, um, just say that, you know, the forecast is not quite right. So here's a piece of data, the forecast, okay? That that really needs a little more thought, a little more work. And in my experience, for this particular product, your forecast is always a little high. Not, not that many people come to the well, you know, to buy that thing as you think they're gonna be, all right? And and this thing picks that up and it and it's based on a reward system, okay? And the reward is if I get the scenario right, I reward it. So think of this particular branch of uh, uh, machine learning as being like training your dog, okay? And so, you know, if the dog rolls over, I give it a bone. If it doesn't roll over, you know, I shout at it or something, right? And so that, you know, the shout is the penalty and it doesn't like the shout. So it always goes for the bone, okay? Um, and, and so that's kind of the state of the art today. Um, and I think in five years, we'll just keep improving that by adding more data and, you know, I guess what I want to call um, wisdom. Very thoughtful and great insights on digital twin theory. My next question to you is, uh, today, how is, how is the jobs in data science market and AI market in the U.S.? And please share with our listeners about your personal and professional technology journey. Okay, well, thanks. Well, first of all, they, uh, uh, the, the area of uh, being a data scientist is um, a, a super area. So not only is it um, uh, intellectually stimulating, okay, but the job market at this moment is off the charts, right? I mean, we don't have enough good data scientists. So universities are trying to crank them out. In fact, a lot of the universities that have been traditional schools have online programs just so they can accelerate the, um, you know, the need for this, okay? And then uh, actually, if you add another area, you know, looking out, let's say five years. So if I added the area of a data scientist, let's say in a quantum environment, okay? There's so few of those kinds of people and the need is gonna be so big once these quantum computers, <clears throat> for instance, that IBM is building, uh, starts to mature a little bit, right? Um, so there's pockets of uh, data science, I think, that are really sparse, that for people who are in those pockets, the opportunity is huge. So, so this is something that if you, uh, you know, if you had a kid in college or something, and, uh, you know, you kind of said, well, you know, what should I do? Um, boy, I'd put data science right out there if, uh, you know, if they were so inclined to do it. Um, to, the second question was on my uh, personal journey, okay? So I, I've been um, thrilled with numbers since I was a kid. Okay, and uh, just got, you know, very good at math. Um, I went to school for uh, a PhD in operations research. And so I'm pretty passionate about uh, decision making, um, decision making under uncertainty. Okay, um, and that and that's an area I really like to, uh, let's say, specialized in. So that that was a, you know, a, a, probably a pretty good path back then when it wasn't very popular uh, is for so whatever reason that you go you know down a path or something right uh, but it turned out to be that that's that's a skill that is super useful in this uh, artificial intelligence environment okay you know the ability to work with data and to manipulate it if i if i were going to say if i made a, um, a so that's one let's say good decision maybe a bumble into that one don't know but a, but a good conscious decision let's say that i made was to really focus on uh, what our clients are doing. 
because our clients have these um, really interesting problems that you just don't see in research. So research can get you into the area, but the client will take you to a place where, you know, the data is ugly, the, uh, you know, the, the circumstances around it, their customers are terrible. You know what I mean? So it's, it's the real problem. Okay, that you have to deal with. And it's all these dimensions of this real problem. So the one thing that I like to do is I kind of lose my identity, let's say as an IBM, okay? And I take on the identity of the client. So I start to think like the client so that I can imagine what it is that they're actually going through. And I try to learn that environment, you know, better than my client can learn it, okay? And so, um, you know, when I start to uh, understand it better than my client, then I know I'm sort of there, okay? So that's, that's when I say, okay, now I really understand the problem. All right. And um, so so that to me is a conscious, uh, let's say, uh, activity. And I and I like to do that as many times as you know humanly possible so that I'm actually consumed by our client's problem and uh, start to deal with all the dimensions of it, because it isn't just the technology. It's also how do they adopt it? OK, so it's the it's, you know, to me, technology is 50 percent of the ride. Right. And the other 50 percent is the human part. You know, how do how do I um, use it? How do I manipulate it? Do I trust it? OK, um, you know, all those kinds of questions that come into um, play when you do something that's really complicated with a lot of data. Um, the math is, you know, very serious. OK, um, you know, it's not a very easy environment and to be able to. Um, uh, you know, pour yourself into your client's shoes and live that, you know, is, uh, I, I think that's uh, exactly what our clients need. So that that's a conscious good move. So I would recommend that uh, to our audience as well. Being a fellow is the highest honor in the field of technology. Today with us was Dr. Michael Haydock, sharing his thoughts on artificial intelligence, making conscious-based decisions, current job markets, and ways to address world-class challenges. We hope you like this inspirational and insightful podcast. Please learn, share, and subscribe.